Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Can everyone can hear me and see the screen? All right, great, perfect, perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for taking the time out of your evenings um, to listen to this. And I, I hope you guys all learned something um, because obviously I'm passionate about this and I think it's very important um, to spread the word, not just about um, men's sexual health, but also to learn about the advances and the new things that are out there these days that not, not many people know about, not many doctors know about, let alone patients. So we'll jump in. As Michael mentioned, just a little bit uh, about me. So I did my residency in, in urology. So I'm, a, uh, I'm trained as a urologist. I did my res uh, residency at Cedar sinai Then I moved on for fellowship. So I did a men's health fellowship. In my, uh, I specialized in microsurgery, male fertility, um, sexual dysfunction. And then ultimately I joined, uh, I came back to Cedars. I joined the private practice group, Tower Urology, um, doing specializing in, again, not just general urology, but the men's health aspects of it. So my clinic, uh, it's really, it's two things. I focus on sexual health and the reproductive health, all in the males. Um, so decreased libido, sexual dysfunction, orgasmic dysfunction, some of the newer technologies such, such as shockwave therapy, and then reproductive health. So this is, you know, a lot of younger guys have issues with fertility. They have issues um, not just achieving or trying to have kids, but sometimes they have a vasectomy and then later on they want to, um, they want to reverse the vasectomy, which is a you know, very challenging microsurgical case. So we could start the talk off by saying, you know, why is men's sexual health important? And if you guys have questions, um, I mean, if you guys have any burning questions, we could talk about it at the end of each slide or save them for the end and we could discuss it then. But um, this is a nice quote that I found when it comes to why is men's sexual health important? So sex is like money, only too much is enough, right? So there's, you know, and this is really, there's a lot of patients who, who um, I had a guy who came in today, 65 year old guy who he's, um, he's like, I'm 65 years old. Things don't work the way they used to, but up here, but mentally, you know, I still want to, I still have that drive. I think, I still think like I'm in my, my mid twenties. I'm still very attracted to my wife. I'm still very attracted to other women. I want to be able to have intercourse and, you know, 20, 30, maybe 30 years ago was a different story, but these days we, you know, we have the technology and we have the medications and we have the, um, the advances in order pro to provide good sexual quality of life upwards of, you know, guys who are you know, sexually active even into their mid eighties. And, you know, the thing here is it, it's, it's a taboo topic for a lot of guys. Um, you know, my clinic, I focus on this, you know, and um, because of that, because of that, like I, I tell patients, you know, I'll, I'll pay you a hundred bucks if you ever make me blush. There's nothing that I haven't heard. So if there's anything, you know, a lot of guys feel con concerned about saying things, guys like to talk about sex, women like to talk about sex, but doctors aren't trained to talk about it. But my goal is, you know, at my clinic is at least to break those barriers down and allow patients to feel comfortable and to talk about those types of things. So in today's talk, we'll start off by talking about testosterone, then erectile dysfunction, and then BPH, which is very common. And then we'll talk about prostate cancer and Peyronie's disease. So we'll start it off with testosterone. So testosterone, right? This is, you know, in the 90s, this was a huge crave. Everyone was talking about testosterone. It's one of the biggest uh, medical industries in terms of revenue um, in the last couple of decades, everyone was getting testosterone. Uh, you know, why, why were they getting testosterone? If you think about the signs and, sim signs and symptoms of testosterone, I'll talk about in, the, in a moment, um, you know, they, everyone wanted to feel like a better man as they aged, right? And all it is is a simple blood test. That's all it takes in order to get your testosterone checked. So what are the signs? First off, um, a lot of guys will complain about low sex drive, fatigue, poor exercise tolerance, hair loss just not feeling the way they did, you know, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, erectile dysfunction. Um, and as men age, it's not abnormal to have decreased levels of testosterone. And uh, how do you diagnose testosterone? Testosterone requires, it's very basic, it's a blood test. You know, generally what we like to recommend, we like to have two blood tests done in, a, in the early morning. So before, ideally before 10 a.m. And the reason behind that is without getting too confusing with this graph, the reason behind it is your early morning is when you peak, your testosterone levels peak. So we want to see where your peak levels are. And then at that point, we could diagnose whether you actually are hypogonadal or you have low testosterone levels. And the normal testosterone, this is something important that I always like to say, is normal testosterone range is anywhere from 300 to 1,000. Now that's a broad, broad range, right? But my testosterone level requirements are very different than, you know, let's say Michael's. And it's very different than, let's say, an NFL player's. So as much as the number is important, the symptoms are more important, right? So you do want to 
you know, the numbers give you some sense of how to treat, but you don't want to necessarily treat the number. You want to treat the symptoms. So although, you know, sometimes, you know, a, a tight end that, you know, there's you know, football players will come in and they'll be, their testosterone levels are at 500. And they're like, I feel like you know, I don't feel good. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to. Their testosterone levels are a lot, that their testosterone requirement is a lot higher. So it's the symptoms that we focus on as well. Why does testosterone decrease it? Part of it is natural aging, right? Like anything else, any other organ in your body, as you age, it doesn't function the way it used to. So the testicles and the pituitary gland, which secrete, which stimulate the testicles, um, those, like, like anything else, they start to decrease in function as you age. Weight gain, so lifestyle things, such as weight gain. Um, I'll, I'll talk about something, an interesting study they looked at when it came to weight gain. Sleep, stress, and then what exercise as well. All of these cause issues with um, a decreased testosterone level. So when it comes to weight gain, so this was actually pretty interesting. So a 10% increase in your total body weight will result in about an 85 point decrease in your testosterone. A 15% decrease in your body will result in a 230 point decrease in your testosterone level. So it shows you weight and testosterone, there's a correlation there. The more weight you gain, and, and it's inversely proportional as well. If you lose that 10%, if you lose that 15%, those testosterone levels will start to improve as well. Sleep, sleep. And this is something that um, I know I could say I have problems with it. And I'm sure there's a lot of people here who could preach the same thing. So when it comes to sleep, the interesting thing about sleep and testosterone, it's really what it comes down to. It's, it's the last four hours of sleep that are the most important in terms of maintaining good testosterone levels. So the first four hours aren't as important, but if you have, if you, if you're able to sleep, so if you go to sleep at, let's say eight, let's say someone sleeps for eight hours a night, you go to sleep at eight and you wake up at um, um, 6 a.m. If those last four hours are actually uninterrupted sleep, your testosterone levels will, pay, will stay pretty steady. But ironically, most people, it's the beginning that they're actually able to stay asleep. And those, that last half is when they actually have issues sleeping. Thus, their testosterone decreases. Um, again, this is another slide that talks about um, in terms of restriction of sleep, um, Eight nights of restricted to five hours of sleep reduced their testosterone levels by ten, by about ten percent. Um, and without getting too sciencey here, this was so there was something that looked at they compared residents in the hospital, uh, internal medicine residents con compared to other hospital personnel. So you could think of lack of sleep, stress, these types of things, um, versus you know other you know the nurses and um, some of the administrators in the hospital. The testosterone levels were significantly decreased. So really, all of this goes to show sleep is incredibly important when it comes to maintaining normal testosterone levels. Now, what do we do, right? What do we do if you have low testosterone? This is low testosterone levels. And this is where um, we've made some significant strides as a medical community over the last few decades, really a, trying to um, adapt to and really address every patient's needs and concerns when it comes to administration. So the way to break it down is there's three, there's three ways to think about testosterone administration. You do it either daily, weekly, or quarterly. So the gels, there's a gel, and this is the generic androgel. You apply it to your shoulder. Every day you come out of the shower once a day, and that maintains a steady level of testosterone. There's the weekly, which is generally the injections, right? You inject yourself. We could teach you how to do it. You either inject yourself in your muscle or into your subcutaneous fat in your belly, and that you do that once, or, once a week or once every other week. And then quarterly, and this is what a lot of patients prefer. Um, the most common version of this is something called the, the testosterone pellets, which they go underneath the skin. You come in every three months, we place testosterone pellets underneath the skin. And over the course of three months, it maintains a nice steady state of testosterone, and providing you with all those benefits that we talked about, addresses the low libido, erectile dysfunction, fatigue, exercise intolerance, those types of things. And now these are the newer ones, right? These are some of the newer testosterone um, formulation. So this is Jatenzo. This is a newer one. This is an oral testosterone therapy. So some guys are like, I don't want the gel because the gel, one thing I forgot to mention about the gel is, you know, you rub it on your shoulder. There's a risk of transference. So if you have a young like, grandson at home, for example, a grandchild for two hours after applying it, you know, we recommend not necessarily holding, holding or touching somebody because you could transfer that testosterone onto that, uh, the other person. Um, injections, some guys are fearful of needles. So they, they, they don't do that. Um, they prefer not to use the injection. And some people don't want to come in quarterly. So anyway, Jitenzo is one, oral testosterone therapy, um, very well tolerated. Um, the previous formulations of this had liver issues, but this, this is actually very stable and it works very, very well. 
Zaya said, so some guys, some guys have issues when it comes to, um, they don't want to see the needle, right? They have issues with injecting themselves with the needle. So this is actually, it's a, it hides the needle. So it's kind of like an insulin. Um, it's small, as small as the insulin syringe. And if it injects, you basically pull it, put it to your skin and self inject. So you don't really see the needle. You don't have to pull the trigger. You don't have to do anything that's associated with injecting yourself. And this reduces the fear and anxiety for a lot of guys who are fearful of needles. And then finally, uh, this is one that recently came out to market. It's called Natesto. This is actually an intranasal testosterone gel, right? Where this is, uh, it's the only issue with this is you do it three times a day, but a lot of guys like it because it, the other thing, the good thing about this is, it, um, and I'll talk, I'll talk about this. When it comes to testosterone, usually it compromises your fertility, right? It kills your natural ability to produce sperm. This does the opposite. It actually is able to maintain healthy testosterone levels while also um, not compromising your, your uh, fertility and future uh, ability to produce sperm. Um, a lot, a big question that I get from guys, and, I, and maybe some of you are versed in this, is when it comes to testosterone and heart disease. So um, in the 90s, uh, initially, there was a study that came out that said testosterone is associated with heart attacks, testosterone is associated with strokes. And that was a big thing. So the, um, the way it's a schedule one drug, testosterone is one of those things that it, it's, it's hard to get because of the fact that, that, because of that initial study, right? And as a scientific community, we believed it for a while. We actually did. However, um, we've learned a lot more about this over the last few years, and I'll address each one here. So when it comes to testosterone and cardiovascular risk, right, what, it, what is the association? So this is what we've learned as a scientific community when it comes to testosterone and testosterone and mortality, okay? So we found that if you have, if you compare a 65-year-old guy who has low testosterone versus the same 65-year-old guy who has a normal testosterone level, that guy who has a normal testosterone level will live longer, right? And that's what this graph shows. The guy who has normal testosterone levels, his cumulative survival is higher than the one who's low testosterone, right? We've learned that, right? So when it comes to, and why, right? Why? And I'll tell you why, why right now. So um, because what we've learned is there's actually an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in those guys who have low testosterone. And part of it is because we're, you know, as men, we need testosterone, right? For all bodily functions in terms like in terms of internal functions. And secondly, having normal testosterone levels gives you the ability to go exercise. It gives you, it gives you a sense of vitality. It gives you a sense of, of, um, thriving, wanting to go out there and enjoy yourself, whether it's socially, physically, um, sexually, all these things that give you the ability to be a man and enjoy life. Testosterone allows you to do that if you are low in testosterone. So, um, the data, the data, I mean, if you look at here, there's only, the, the, so I will go back to that initial study in the night, in the nineties, that first study that came out, once they went, went through it again, they realized that there's a lot of false information about it. There was women in the, in the study. Um, they didn't actually, it wasn't a very well done study. So ultimately what we found is over 200 articles have been published since then. And as a medical society, we agree that if testosterone could actually, well, testosterone benefits you long-term in terms of more, uh, cardiovascular risk, as well as mortality. The other very common question, testosterone and prostate cancer, right? What's the correlation there? So we know, to, we know prostate cancer to a certain extent is uh, hormone mediated, right? The more, the more testosterone we ha you have, there's a uh, potential to have increased um, prostate cancer, right? Um, inversely, if I don't know if um, anybody, you know, when it comes to prostate cancer, if you have metastatic prostate cancer, we give you a medication that decreases, that essentially takes your testosterone to nothing, and that's the treatment for advanced prostate cancer. However, however, we've also learned something about this. And without getting too technical, again, in these graphs, if you, so this is the other thing we learned. We looked at young men and old men when it comes to testosterone levels and PSA. So PSA is um, it's a biomarker. It's a blood biomarker we use to measure. Um, it gives us some sense of prostate cancer, right, in terms of um, prostate activity. That's what it does tell us. So we do know when you have prostate cancer, generally your PSA goes up. So what we found is if you increase your testosterone levels, right? If you, your weekly testosterone levels here, your, you know, your, your blood testosterone levels will increase. However, look at, with the blue, the blood testosterone levels go up, but if you look at the brown, it stays steady, right? There's no increase. Same thing in older men, as the testosterone levels increase, the PSA stays the same, right? There's no increase. And this is, this was a, you know, we, we didn't know much about this and we learned and the question is why, why is it like this? So the, the prevailing theory now is there's something called the prostate saturation model. And what it is, is that um, the prostate cells, they could only 
absorb or react to a certain level of testosterone. So the prevailing theory is anywhere from 150 to 200 testo points of testosterone. Anything above that will not increase your testosterone, or your PSA level, excuse me. So as you could see here, if you, so if you have a, a, a testosterone level of 350 and your PSA is two, if you increase that, that testosterone to 700, your PSA won't increase, right? Or it shouldn't increase dramatically. It'll stay pretty much the same. Again, because it comes down to the saturation model. As long as um, you're anywhere between or above 250, those prostate cells have been saturated and no longer will respond to an increase in testosterone levels. So again, that's been debunked, right? That when, when it comes to testosterone and, and prostate cancer, we've, we've realized it's actually safe. And I didn't include this here, but there's some clinical trials going on in um, MD Anderson where they're looking at actually giving high dose, guys who have metastatic prostate cancer, they're giving them high doses of, of uh, testosterone intermittently, not continuously, but intermittently. And they found that the body responds well to it. Again, because your body needs testosterone. It's good for immune function as well. It gives your, um, your, your immune system actually responds well to it in order to attack those cancer cells. When it comes to testosterone and fertility, right? And this is what I was talking about. Um, this is what I was uh, mentioning earlier. So exogenous testosterone. So all these forms of testosterone that, I'm ta that I've talked about, um, they decrease, they will essentially eliminate your, or stop your body's ability to produce sperm naturally, right? So this is something that you always have to tell patients, especially the younger patients who are interested in this. Um, it's, it's just one thing to be mindful of. So we are, so we always ask, you know, if you're, if you are interested in fertility, we'll, we won't necessarily put you on testosterone. There's other therapies available for you. Um, that will give you the ability to, um, to naturally increase your testosterone levels. Um, so in review, when it comes to testosterone, um, low testosterone levels are associated, have been associated with, with an increased risk of heart attacks as well as strokes. And there's no convincing data to support that, you know, testosterone replacement therapy causes prostate cancer. And finally, when it comes to fertility and testosterone, there's um, just something to be mindful of. Now, the next topic, we'll talk about erectile dysfunction. Um, so erectile dysfunction, this is probably one of the most common things every guy um, not just reads about, is interested in, experiences. Um, I have patients as young as 20 up until in their, in their 90s who have some form of erectile dysfunction. It's incredibly common. Um, and generally what I say is, you know, guys who are 40, about 40% of them have uh, experienced erectile dysfunction. At the age of 50, about 50% of guys, 60, 60%, and it goes on. Um, and again, you know, it's, um, there's something we could do for this because it's, it impacts so many guys. Um, so the erection process to, I mean, it, it's as simple as you need blood to come in and then you need that blood to stay in there, right? That's the idea. And that's what most of these medications work on maintaining the, um, blood within the, um, the chambers of the penis. So what do you need? What do you need for, for an erection, right? In simple terms, you need four things, right? You need good blood flow. The reasons why you won't have good blood flow, and these are health things, diabetes, hypertension, elevated cholesterol levels. Those decrease the caliper of the lumen of the arteries. Blood's not coming in, right? So you need good blood flow. The second thing you need is you need good hormone level, testosterone. Not just testosterone, but you need good estrogen levels, and I'll get to that. The third thing you need is you need neurologically. So um, if anyone's had a, uh, had a friend or has undergone uh, a prostatectomy for prostate cancer, those nerves, those nerves for erections, they ride along the prostate. And what could sometimes happen is those nerves are compromised during the surgery, um, ultimately um, leading to some form of erectile dysfunction. So that the nerves are very important. And finally, there's a huge mental component to this, um, to erectile dysfunction, uh, more so in younger guys. So I have a lot of young patients, 20s and 30s, who, um, whether it's because they had a bad sexual experience, whether it's because they watch a lot of pornography, um, their view, their reality, their sense of, um, of what um, a healthy erection should be or what a healthy sex life should be is altered. And as a result of that, they have anxiety, they have stress um, when they're trying to perform and therefore they have some form of um, erectile dysfunction. So in simple terms, those are the four things you need. Um, heart disease and erectile dysfunction, as I talked about, you, know, you need good blood flow because the vessels to the penis, because the arteries to the penis are so much smaller than the ones that provide blood flow to your heart, provide blood to your brain, we always say that um, ED may be the first sign um, of a more serious issue, right? So, um, it's, so it's a silent indicator of cardio, uh, coronary artery disease. So um, as important as it is to um, you know, see, as you know, a lot of guys will, will, who experience uh, erectile dysfunction, what they'll do is they'll 
Um, just ask a friend, for example, or they go to Romans and hymns, one of these online websites, just to get Cialis, Viagra, Stendra, whatever it is. And it works, right? And, you know, for a broad majority of guys, it, it works because, um, and it's fine in, in, in a good, in a broad majority of guys, it actually works. However, um, I will say this, when I was at UCLA, we did this study where we looked at, we looked at um, our erectile dysfunction patients who came in, right? And we looked at them, we did a, a metabolic workup, endocrine workup, hormonal panel. And what we found was about 40% of the guys actually had something metabolically wrong with them. So it wasn't like, um, this was the natural progression of, of poor erections. What it was is they had something wrong and something correctable, right? So that's the thing I always try to preach is even if you have erectile dysfunction, first of all, you, it's, you know, there's no taboo associated with it, right? You shouldn't be fearful of it because it's so, so common, right? Unbelievably common. You should see a physician about it and you should get some kind of workup to see whether or not it's something correctable. So let's say theoretically you had some, um, it was a blood flow issue where you do have you know, elevated cholesterol levels that you never knew of. Hey, we'll put you on a statin that, that should correct that. You know, pro providing protection for your heart as well as potentially correcting erectile dysfunction. Or let's say it was low testosterone that that um, that um, was the cause of erectile dysfunction. But ultimately, I always try to preach this. As, as great as it is to go to Roman and hymns, it's more important just to get evaluated. And it's such a simple evaluation. Um, simple and easy and, and very, very important for ultimate uh, longevity. When it comes to treatment options, briefly here, we'll go over this. Um, the oral medications, we all know these. Um, uh, there's the Viagras, and they've made so many of these depending on timing, right? There's ones that act within uh, 15 minutes. There's ones, you know, Stendra, the quickest acting one. There's ones like Viagra within an hour. There's um, Cialis, which is like the weekend one. It can last anywhere from 24 to 36 hours. And most guys do incredibly well in this. I say about 80% of guys actually do fantastic on the oral therapies. Um, those that don't do well on the oral therapies, we move on, on to um, the, next, the next stage. Um, so I always say, I always say, um, I promise you, we'll get you to have a good erection no matter what. It all depends on how aggressive you want to be. We have options for, uh, we will get you to have a good, healthy erection. Again, it all depends on how aggressive you want to be. So the next stage is the gels. This is gels that you insert into the urethra. Um, it gets absorbed by the penis um, and causes that vasodilation and gives you a good, strong erection. This is more about 50% of guys like this. They, some of them swear by it. Some of them don't even have a, a response to it. So this one's a little bit more hit and miss. Um, the intracavernosal injection. So these are injections that actually go, as you can see here from the picture, uh, it's like an insulin syringe. It goes directly into the erectile body. It's, uh, it's a very small needle. Um, I do understand that there's a taboo with injecting yourself, uh, but once that taboo is broken, a lot of guys love this. They go on for decades using this therapy. Um, and uh, they do really well with this. This is actually very, very common. And then this is the gold standard, the current gold standard, actually, uh, at least when it comes to, to um, erectile dysfunction. This is the inflatable penile prosthesis. So if you, um, this is essentially what it works, the way it works is you have two cylinders, and it's all internalized, two cylinders in the penis, a pump in the scrotum, and then there's a reservoir that goes in the lower abdomen. And what you do is you pump up the, uh, the you pump this in the scrotum, and the fluid from the reservoir goes in, uh, into the cylinders and causes an erection. So if you remember like the, uh, the Reebok pumps, essentially from the 90s, similar to that, you just pump it up. Um, and guys do really great on this. this is the, these devices, they stay in there anywhere from 10, 15, 20 years. And um, guys love it. Guys love it, actually. This is really, um, they're, they're happy with it. So um, this is kind of the chronology of of where we are in terms of medications. And the question is, where's the future, right? Where's the future of this? And the future is we're, we're, le we're learning this right now. We're working on this as a scientific community, but um, this is something that actually um, has good data to support it actually. And we're, the more we learn about it, the more impressed we are and the more um, we are, we're willing to actually provide this or do this for patients. So what it is, is it's shockwave therapy. So these are sound waves. These are sound waves that, um, pneumatic sound waves that stimulate growth factors in the penis that, um, that increase blood flow, increase uh, blood vessel generation. So the way this came about was, uh, if there's any urologists in the crowd, so there's, um, there was a technology known as shockwave lithotripsy. So back in the 80s, if you had a kidney stone, uh, what we could have done is we could have done shockwaves, these same sound waves, and they were able to penetrate into the kidney and break that kidney stone up. But what, what urologists during that time found out is, you know, some patients had gone through this shockwave therapy so many times, and then 
as you know, later on, the doctor, the surgeon went in there and they, they, you had to remove the kidney for whatever reason. They looked at the kidney and they're like, wow, this kidney is so vascularized, right? It has so much more um, like blood vessel. Like you could tell it has, has received so much more blood vessels than like, for example, the other kidney. And you know, the, the question was why, why, why? And then um, science and experimentation, we realized that these high, high intensity sound waves, high energy sound waves stimulate, like I said, the growth factors that promote this new blood vessel growth. So we've tried, they tried it on rat models, they tried it on rat penises, and the data was very good. Um, and now we're trying it on humans. And anecdotally, back in the day, a few, um, a few years ago, I would say it was great. And then now there's good science to support it and say, uh, they've done studies, they've done great studies on this, um, that again, support the use of shockwave therapy. I will say it's not covered by insurance. It's the only one that's not covered by insurance. So it does cost money depending on where you go. Uh, but there is, this is a regenerative form of erectile dysfunction therapy. So it's not something that treats the symptoms that actually uh, could reverse your erectile dysfunction. It's also, so the other thing about it is it's used in other, it's, uh, other technologies that, um, other, excuse me, uh, disease processes that may require more blood vessel growth, plantar fasciitis, tendonitis, even for myocardial vascularization for these guys who have, um, who had series of, of um, uh, myocardial infarctions. And this goes, goes through what it is. So the projectile basically hits a target. It doesn't hurt this, it doesn't hurt the skin at all. It doesn't hurt the penis. You just feel a little bit of pressure. Um, and that, you know, that pressure wave that's generated hits the target, like I said, promotes blood vessel growth um, via um, uh, growth factors. Now, the next one, this is something a little bit newer as well, platelet-rich plasma. So I think there was, a, you know, a few, after Kobe Bryant uh, popularized this, or at least he brought it mainstream with doing PRP injections into his knee, uh, everyone started doing it in different parts of the body. So, we're, you know, urologists were no different. So we started injecting inside the penis. And um, this too, this too, we're learning a little bit more about this now. And the data on this is still, um, we're still learning. Like I said, we're still trying to figure out how, or who it's best for. There's definitely a patient population where this works in, but we're trying to identify who those patients are um, in order to you know, actually use it and provide good benefit to them. And again, this one is not covered by insurance either. So what it does is it, it, by releasing the growth factors, it simulates the increase in the number of cells, at least reparative cells, um, and it, it could potentially reverse um, the fibrosis that causes erectile dysfunction in the penis. Um, so in review, ED, incredibly, incredibly common. Um, most men, broad uh, majority of men are experiencing it. Um, and as much as we have good therapies that treat the symptoms, we're currently working on finding those that are, uh, uh, could provide a cure. And we're getting there in terms of regenerative therapy. Now, BPH, um, and this is something that, again, most guys go through. BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, it's, um, or enlarged prostate. So BPH, think of, think of the prostate, think of the prostate as a donut. Um, there's a hole in the middle where the urine goes through. So as guys age, the donut could get either bigger on the outside or, it could get, or, it could narrow, or get bigger on the inside by obstructing the inside. And in that case, if it obstructs the inside, that's when guys start to have the symptoms, waking up at night because they're not emptying the bladder, weak urinary stream, not emptying the bladder, feeling like they always have to go to the bathroom, those types of symptoms. Again, aren't, they're not life and death by any means, but um, it's quality of life and it, it could severely impact your quality of life when you're not getting good sleep. And when you're not getting good sleep, your testosterone levels will go down as a result of that too. So um, BPH, Part, you know, part of the diagnosis is what most urologists hate to do is a uh, digital rectal exam, just to get a sense of how big the prostate is. Um, the, uh, so when it, comes to, when it comes to the therapies for this, most guys start on the oral therapies. There's two classes of drugs. One of them that helps open up that channel. And those are um, medications such as Flomax, Rapaflo, Cardura. And then there's, the other, there's a newer class of drugs called um, uh, known as like finasteride and dutasteride. And what these do is they shrink the prostate. And one of the uh, benefits to this is, or some guys actually take this prophylactically for male pattern baldness. So it actually, um, it could reverse hair loss as a result of um, uh, basically the biochemical breakdown in your body. But the one thing to be aware of when it comes to uh, these medications, there are se some sexual side effects associated with it. So some guys will have orgasmic issues, libido issues, erectile dysfunction issues as a result of, the, as a result of this, because it does play on your hormones. Now, how do we treat this? So we've treated this for many, many years with transurethral resection of the prostate. And um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but it's basically a road over procedure. We put a camera through the penis um, and then using this loop. So this is the prostate. 
And using this loop, we basically core it out, right? We open up that, that middle of the donut. Uh, that donut was closed. This is gonna help open it up. Obviously this is, and then, you know, we, we create, um, we open up that channel. And it, it, by doing that, it allows the bladder to fully, fully uh, release uh, all the urine within uh, its chamber. However, I mean, that's one option. And obviously as you, as you go on, there's bigger, more open surgery, things where you slightly more invasive um, robotic surgeries. However, I do wanna talk about the advances rather than the, what we currently have. So the, the advances, one of them is called Resume. And what Resume is, is um, this is a um, non-surgical in some ways. It's done in the office. And what it is, is we basically use um, steam in order to shrink the prostate. Um, and what it, you know, we put a, we put a, that's a similar camera through the penis, your, your, your prostate is numbed, uh, you're lightly sedated. And by doing it, by putting it, that, that camera in there and injecting water vapor into the prostate, into the different prostate, parts of the prostate here, as you can see, this is the, uh, the tip of it. Um, over time, you know, some guys experience benefit at two weeks, some guys it takes them a few more weeks than that, but that prostate, that prostate channel shrinks. Uh, or at least the, the prostate tissue shrinks. And as a result of that, that channel opens up, again, allowing for good urinary flow, decreasing you waking up at night, um, and some of the side effects associated with BPH. Another one is something called the prostatic urethral lift. So this is, um, it's basically staples that open up the channel. So again, minimally invasive, it's done in the office as well, similar to um, um, the resume. And what it is is, as you can see here on the left, the left lower one, that, that prosthetic tissue, you see that it's, the, the channel is not open. Those two lobes are touching. And as you can see from the schematic here, there's, there's staples that are put that help that on one end, they, they attach to the, uh, the tissue of the prostate. On the other side, they go to the, uh, the capsule. And as you can see from the picture on the bottom right, that channel is nice and open, allowing for good urinary flow. Here's another, um, um, schematic of it. Uh, they obviously started with this animal studies. Animal studies were very good. So as a result of that, we are doing it. And patients, um, anecdotally patients like it, the science on it is very good as well. And then finally, prostatic artery embolization. This is more for patients who are not surgical candidates. They have either heart issues, they have, um, um, they don't want to go into go surgery. They don't want any procedure. Um, interventional radiologists actually do this. They go in there, they burn parts of the prostate, they burn the blood, um, embolize the blood flow to the prostate. And over the course of weeks to months, the prostate shrinks in size. Um, it's less common, but it is one of the newer th uh, therapies out there. So uh, in review, um, yeah, BPH incredibly common, newer therapies as I discussed. Um, and then the newer therapies are obviously focused on uh, in office rather than taking you to the OR, exposing you to the, risk, exposing you to the risks of anesthesia. So finally, Peroni's disease, um, and this is something that most men don't know about. Uh, however, about 10 to 15% of men actually experience this. And what is Peyronie's disease? It's just curvature of the penis, right? And it's, you know, it's weird um, in a lot of ways uh, in terms of uh, the, the conversation. Patients don't like talking about it, but I can't tell you how common it is. It's, there's tons of commercials about it now. It's associated with Deputrin's contractures. So uh, John Elway, for example, he's, he's a patient that has those contractures in his hand. Um, it's the same mechanism. So the tendons, um, they develop plaques on them. So similar, the, the sheath of the penis, the sheath of the rectile body, they develop plaques. And as a result of it, the way to think about this is Peyronie's disease is like putting a piece of duct tape on a balloon. If you put the piece of duct tape, when the balloon expands, that portion of the balloon that has duct tape is not going to expand. So as a result, the balloon is going to curve to that side, to that direction. Previous to this, again, super, super common. Um, previous to this, it was surgery, surgery, and it was pretty, the, the options we had for it weren't great. Um, there were some injections that we could have done and um, that had some success, but ultimately there was nothing great out there. However, um, in the last uh, decade or two, a medication called Zyflex, it's, it's an injection as well, came out. This is the only FDA medication for this. And it's, whereas the plaque is collagen, uh, Zyflex is an enzyme called collagenase. So you inject it right into the plaque. Uh, this is a fan technique that we popularized at UCLA. Um, and what it does is over the course of six months, that plaque, as you, as you the, um, and put that enzyme in there, that plaque will slowly, slowly start to release and basically give you slowly start to straighten out the penis as a result of it. So as a result, you know, you, before you curved, after you straight. Um, 
so yes, that, that concludes my talk. Um, if you guys have any questions, obviously I'm happy to answer. Feel free, this is a, a QR code. You could just take a picture of that. You can save my contact information. If you have any questions, you could reach out um, using that. That saves my information into your um, contact information or into your um, contacts, your phone contacts. I, uh, I think there's a few questions that are in the chat, if you can see them. Uh, if you'd like me to read them, I can read them to you. Yeah, please. Okay, uh, there's one question. Uh, what is the relationship between prescription drugs, uh, including diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera, and testosterone levels along with ED? Um, good question. So, um, the relate, so I, I will say this, there's a relationship between, so we know testosterone has an impact on metabolic syndromes. So uh, we've noticed that some guys who, are, who have low testosterone and diabetes, if we correct their testosterone levels, their insulin requirement or their metformin requirement will decrease, could potentially decrease. So there is something to be said for needing testosterone when you're, um, if you have a metabolic disorder, such as any, any endocrine or um, uh, diabetes, for example. Now, when it comes to if there's an association, association between the medications and, to, and testosterone, there's no real association. Um, it, 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 I mean, there's no association we actually know of. Okay, um, there's another question of, um, bear with me a second. Oh, um, is the goal of, uh, Tetrode, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, shots um, to get my T level, to get my testosterone to a level of a young man or an age appropriate level. Did, did I uh, bring sense to that question? Yes, yes, that's a that's okay. a great question. That's a great question. So, yeah, so um, our goal when when treating low testosterone is not to give you. So we remember the range. We said three hundred to a thousand. So. Um, these guys who like bodybuilders, they're, they're taking testosterone levels or their stable testosterone levels are in the 1500 to 2000 range. Our goal is not to get you there, right? At that point, that, that it's unsafe at that level, right? There's side effects associated with it. Our goal is to basically put you anywhere between four and 700, right? Roughly, roughly four to 700. And that's just, a, again, the number is a gauge, but the key is the symptom. So um, our goal is to treat the symptom, but our um, number wise, we're trying to get you to that middle tier. What we say is the middle tier. If there's, if there's three um, areas, we try to get you right into that middle um, 400 to 700 testosterone range. That's, that's, our, uh, that's what we're trying to do. And the, the science supports that. That's when you're actually going to be best in terms of uh, mortality, cardiovascular risk, stroke risk. Okay. Um, the next question. Um, does an enlarged prostate affect, affect one's erection and ejaculation? Um, so having a large prostate won't affect your uh, erections. Uh, it has no, it, it, there's, there's no correlation there. Um, now, if it's your, your ejaculation, so, um, to be honest, I haven't heard of, I've never heard of that. However, it could potentially just given the size of, of just given the fact that the prostate is part of the ejaculatory process in terms of it's the conduit for a lot of the, uh, the semen and the, sp the sperm that comes out. So if it's really enlarged, there's a chance that it could potentially cause low flow or low volume ejaculate. Um, but either, you know, it's, it'd be mild if anything. Okay. Um, and the last question I see in the chat, um, when it comes to choosing an, er an erectile helping drug, which have you learned to be a good one? Thoughts about uh, Tadafafil uh, and Pax uh, Ginseng? Ginseng? Um, so I like to, um, Tadalafil, I, I, I like Tadalafil. I prescribe Tadalafil regularly. I think it, um, for a number of reasons, um, the you know the, the penis is really one of those organs. If you don't use it, you you lose it, right? In simple terms. So if you're not getting if you're not getting good blood flow to it, so um, a, ma a younger man over the course of any evening, four to five times a night, he's able to get erections, right? And that's just our body's way of resetting and uh, recalibrating. 
Now, uh, as you age and if you start to experience erectile dysfunction, you're not being able, you're not getting that rise and fall at night. Now, what does that mean? It means that tissue in the penis is not getting oxygenated, it's not getting stretched, it's not getting that exercise. And as a result of that, what could potentially happen is you get fibrosis, where once the erectile dysfunction is, is fixed, the penis is shorter, it's, not, it's less girthy and it's smaller in size. So guys will come in, they're like, hey, listen, I've had erectile dysfunction for two years, now it's fixed, but my penis isn't the same, it's too small. And that's what happens because again, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? You lose, it, it shrinks. So the reason I go to, with, to, to, with Tadalafil, especially early on is it lasts a long time. It lasts for you know, 24 to 36 hours. You're able to get those erections. You're able to get that good blood flow to the penis, making sure it gets that stretch, oxygenation. Um, so the chances of, of penile fibrosis is decreased. Okay, um, we, we have a new uh, round of questions. Here they come. Um, next one. Will you also speak about urge and incontinence? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, so urge incontinence, um, the urge incontinence is a little different. Um, it could be as a result of BPH or the enlarged prostate, but urge incontinence, a lot of times so to, to urinate, you need two things, you need an open prostate and you need a functioning bladder. Um, urge incontinence is a little bit more on the bladder side. There's definitely a prostatic component to it, but it's more the bladder. So um, sometimes what happens is the bladder goes into overactivity. I don't have any slides on this, but I could tell you, um, we have a lot of therapies for urgent continence, oral therapies, um, some neurologic things such as, um, well, there's Botox injections in the bladder. There's neurologic where we stimulate the nerves that control the bladder. Um, but if that's something you are experiencing, feel free to reach out because it's very, uh, we have a lot of good, good a lot of good uh, treatments for that as well. Okay. Um, wanting to know your opinion of prostogenics. Um, it has been very helpful for a person and got off of Flomax, sleeping well at night. Any long-term effects one way or the other? Um, so I think, so prostogenics has some of, it's more, it's a supplement, right? And it has some of the, um, um, the supplements that we know could potentially benefit the prostate or at least benefit um, patients who are experiencing BPH. So um, uh, I don't know exactly what's in it, but I believe it's like Sol Palmento, um, kind of there's lycopene in it. But anyways, any, these supplements, they're, um, you know, I mean, I, it's okay to take. Um, the only thing I would say about supplements is they're not necessarily regulated the same way. So some, some batches of the supplement may be a little different than the than the next. So in terms of quality, there may be an issue. Um, but if it works, if it works, I would say like, you know, it's okay. You could try it. You could still do it. But ultimately, at some point, you should get evaluated. Okay. Um, next one. Does hair loss medication that lowers testosterone really affect testosterone? Um, yeah, so what it does, so, so it, it doesn't necessarily, um, so it doesn't affect, uh, testosterone levels. So what it does is, uh, I wish I could draw here, but testosterone does three things in your body, right? Three things. So it could live in its own form as testosterone. It gets converted to a hormone called DHT. And that's the thing that's responsible for hair loss and prostate growth, right? So DHT gets converted that way, or it gets converted to estrogen, right? Our fat cells convert to estrogen. It could do so. It stays in one of those three states. So when you take finasteride and dutasteride, those ones I talked about that shrink the prostate, you're blocking that conversion to um, DHT. So as a result of that, the prostate shrinks, and you you get your hair. You could potentially get your hair back. But what it does is it pushes it towards estrogen. So because of that, because of that, it, you know, guys will get a little bit of breast tenderness. Because of that, guys will when you have elevated estrogen levels, you'll get sexual side effects. Your erections won't be as good. You're not as, you know, your libido's negatively impacted, um, your orgasms could be impacted. So it doesn't necessarily affect the level of testosterone, it just affects um, the balance or where testosterone, um, the, the homeostasis or the balance between those three forms of, of um, or three main hormones in your body. Uh, what is your opinion on aromatase inhibitors for men on T therapy? Yeah, so great question. So this kind of correlates, it goes back to, this, this, uh, the last question, right? It's, um, it's, uh, so that when testosterone, when I said testosterone could go to either DHT or uh, estrogen, the aromatase inhibitors block the conversion to estrogen. So as a result of that, so some guys need that, right? So 
if guys are on testosterone therapy and they have elevated estrogen levels, you need aromatase, right? You just need a, a healthy balance of it. So is it health? Is it fine? 100%. It's fine. Um, just you got to dose it correctly and make sure that um, you're not um, uh, you're not killing, you're not destroying your, your estrogen levels. You're, every guy needs estrogen. You need estrogen for um, for your healthy cholesterol balance and you need it for bone health. So you don't want to have zero estrogen levels, but it's important to keep them down. Okay, uh, this is a uh, uh, came in in two parts. One is uh, how much of an effect does it have? Oh, I'm sorry, I read it incorrectly. I think the drug being called out here is infestatide. Uh, did I call that correctly, doctor? Infestatide? Yeah. Um, uh, all right, maybe something got, uh, uh, but um, I think this person was trying to ask, uh, how much of an effect does it have on testosterone levels and arousal? Um, maybe the question- Oh, oh, duta oh dutasteride? Maybe they're talking about dutasteride. Oh, it, maybe, maybe some things got left off on the text. Uh, Take it, take it whichever direction you, you please. So, so what was the question? Does dutasteride impact testosterone? Uh, uh, how much of an effect does it have on the testosterone levels and arousal? Yeah, um, that's a good question too. Um, it, for some guys, it's, it, it's very significant. Some guys, they, they feel like even taking, you know, typically you take it at five milligrams um, for the prostate. So some guys, um, at five milligrams, they get really impacted. Some guys at one milligram, they get significantly impacted. Other guys at five milligrams, they have no impact, right? Um, it's, it's tough to say who does get impacted the most. However, it's one of those things that um, if it does impact you, right? If it does have sexual side effects, um, erectile dysfunction, those types of things, we could just take you off of it. Over the course of a few weeks, your hormones will restabilize and that should get you back to normal, get you back to where you should be. Okay. Um, if other folks have questions, this, this is the last one I see here. Please send in your questions if you have something. Um, does taking Cialis regularly help for a healthier prostate? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so Cialis is great. I didn't mention it in this slide, but Cialis is great. But Cialis has two effects. Um, taking it daily, it's good for overall um, getting good blood flow to the penis um, and giving you good erection, especially at the low dosage. But it's also recommended, it has the, this, the other indication for it is BPH, right? You could take it for BPH. Um, there, it, the receptors allow for, it acts in a similar way to Flomax where it helps open up the channel. So it is, it's great. It's great to take. Um, the, the beautiful thing about Cialis right now is um, it's, it's incredibly cheap because it's generic. Uh, certain pharmacies, you can get 90 pills for anywhere from 12 to $15 cash. Um, so a three month supply for, um, 15 bucks, which is, which isn't bad. So yeah, I think it's Cialis is great for, um, any, any guy who's experiencing BPH or erectile dysfunction. It really is. Okay. Uh, is it ever good to use Viagra for off label purposes, such as working out or others? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, but, um, I know people who do it. So, um, but no, it's not, I mean, it, it does cause vasodilation, obviously. So, so the way Viagra works is it opens up the, the blood vessels, the arteries primarily, but also has some effects on the veins, but it opens up the, um, it allows for blood flow primarily to the penis, but because it's, you have receptors everywhere, it acts systemically, it acts in the whole body. So some guys will feel like they get more pumps exercise wise, they get a little bit more veiny, um, but there's other things that could do that that aren't prescription. You could take supplements for that. So I wouldn't take it just for that. No. Uh, you know, by the way, I think we should have renamed the session of everything you were afraid to ask uh, before, yeah. you know, you, you, you to your point of, uh, of uh, people aren't afraid to talk about their sexuality, uh, but no, it's, people love know, talking about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I, uh, more questions. This is fantastic here. Um, but one comment first, uh, one of our members pointed out how um, tower urology has been such a great friend to the Sinai Temple Men's Club. Doctors uh, Danoff, uh, Bowie, uh, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, uh, yeah. and yourself have contributed so much. And clearly, um, you know, with your contact information and the scan that, um, you know, and if anybody's not aware, you just take a picture with your phone of the 
of the coding on the right, and it comes up with the doctor's uh, information to um, to book with him directly. Um, you've been, you know, a great friend for us. But uh, once again, more more questions, and as I say, yeah, they're, yeah, they're coming in here. So, um, uh, will taking finasteride for hair loss cause any concerning side effects? Um, if you do not have prostate enlargement? Um, so the, the hair loss portion of, uh, of VPH, of, um, excuse me, of finasteride, uh, you take it at a lower dose. You take it at that one milligram dose. Um, some guys will take it daily. Some guys will take it like once every couple days. Um, so just to minimize the sexual side effects. But, you know, the main, the main side effect um, at one milligram, again, is the sexual stuff. It's the sexual, it's the... Uh, decreased libido. Um, it's similar to the five milligrams, but again, it's tough to say who responds to what dosage. So um, taking it at one, your chances are slightly less, but like not not nil. So it's important to know if you do experience, you could just coming coming off of it or decreasing the dosing could potentially help. Okay, I think that's the list of questions that I have. Um, you know, doctor, I thought today was going to be a, a men's only session, but there were some women who stayed throughout. So clearly you've, you've piqued their curiosity. And, and I remember in setting up this session and maybe you want to talk a little bit about, because I found it fascinating how um, in your practice, how um, some of the appointments, the, it's the wife who, who leads the husband in the office. Is that something that do you think is appropriate to mention to this group? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it definitely happens, right? But what the patient wives will call and say, hey, listen, because, you know, it, kind of like what we alluded to earlier in terms of the, um, the, the taboos, even guys over the phone, they don't, say, don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about it. Um, so it's, um, it's, you know, one of those things that it's, uh, the wife will call, the wife will, you know, say, hey, listen, my, my husband's problem, having problems, or the wife, or the wife will call when it comes to fertility, a lot of times it's the fertility stuff too, because the wife is very active and wants to uh, procreate. The husband is kind of there along there for the, uh, the ride. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, listen, everyone, like I said, everyone likes to talk about sex. Men like to talk about it. Women like to talk about it. I'm here to address the male issues. I'm happy to talk about um, what I know about the female issues, but um, it's important. It's important. If there's one takeaway, it's, you know, no matter how old you are, how old you are, there's, you know, having sex is incredibly important and, um, uh, there's um, having good sexual quality of life. There's a lot for you, a lot. Hey, uh, we're, let's take these last two questions and then wrap up for tonight. Uh, you've been so insightful for not only the folks listening, but the folks who are asking questions. I think this is fantastic. The last two, well, the last two questions. Number one, um, is red light therapy effective at increasing testosterone? Yeah, um, that's a good question as well. So. Um, there is there is some science supporting that. Um, so it's red light uh, infrared therapy, and um, off the top of my head, I can't necessarily tell you what the science is behind it, but uh, or the mechanism behind it. But I have read that uh, there's good data to support that it does work. Um, not just for it also works for healing, but it, it definitely supports uh, increased testosterone levels. So there's clinics or there's places that um, they do red light therapy on the whole body um, to you know inflammation. Heat, like I said, healing. And there's other places where literally they'll have a small, they'll have a small um, uh, infrared light that shines right on your testicles. And the idea there is it stimulates uh, testosterone production. Okay, last question. Um, are there any exercises better than others at increasing testosterone? Would you consider weightlifting versus cardio versus yoga? Uh, what are your views? Yeah, great question. So um, when it comes to testosterone, um, there's different things you could do. Weightlifting obviously is the best. And when it comes to weightlifting, there's the, you want the, the things you want to focus on are the big muscle groups. So you want to focus on your quads. So doing squats. When you, you want to focus on your hamstrings, um, doing um, deadlifts. The big uh, your back muscles, even your chest. So the big muscle groups are the ones that would actually stimulate um, or lead to increased testosterone uh, faster. Uh, cardio, cardio, look, everyone needs cardio, right? Cardio is important. It should be part of your, it should be part of your exercise regimen. Um, I always say at least 18 minutes of elevated of, of heart rate into 150 every day. Um, but, uh, weightlifting is the key to, to natural testosterone production from, from uh, exercise standpoint. 
And, and by the way, the exercise, um, is it a Kegel or Kingle? Is yeah, that Kegel, Kegel. What, any opinions on that? Yeah, so Kegels are different, right? Kegels aren't necessarily for testosterone, but uh, Kegels are for, um, they're for men who have, have had prostatectomies and they're for men who haven't had prostatectomies. So what it is, is that muscle, what, he, what Michael's referring to is the muscle that you use to stop your urinary scream um, while you're urinating, you know, you squeeze that muscle and you stop urinating. That muscle is, it's the pelvic floor muscle, basically. It's responsible for so much. It's responsible for uh, urination, defecation, orgasm, amongst other things. It also helps keep all the organs inside your, your abdomen without falling out. Um, so it's a very strong muscle area. And the thing is you could do, I mean, you could strengthen it. You could strengthen it. So um, typically we, we tell patients to do it for urinary issues. If they're leaking, you could strengthen that muscle to help uh, decrease leaking, but some guys like to do it for orgasm. They strengthen that muscle. They do 40 contractions a day, like doing 40 um, um, uh, curls, like bicep curls. You do 40 of those and the muscles of that, those muscles over time, they hyper hypertrophy gets stronger and then potentially causing a stronger, um, leading to a stronger orgasm and better ejaculation. Well, that, that closes out the, the many questions from all different angles. We're, we're so grateful for um, you spending time with us today, for your sharing insight. Uh, I think many of the statistics and the procedures and the different things that not only were available and are available, but what's coming out have really opened up our eyes. And, um, you know, in sharing your contact information, I encourage everyone out on this, on this call to... Um, to reach out to Justin and, and you know, seek his expertise. And um, yeah, as you see, I think he has a wealth of knowledge. I think he, he also, you know, can make recommendations of there's multiple choices. And, but the most important thing I think you've represented us tonight is that no matter what age we are, um, the ability to live fully. And I think, you know, Rabbi will be, uh, you know, quotes out a statement. It's not the years you live. It's the life you live within your years. Right. And that's what you're you. getting to us. And, um, you know, I, I, I think of, um, um, you know, the folks who you know, are listening here and, and how, how to better themselves. And by the way, hopefully no one has any of these challenges, but the right, folks right, who, right. who are, you're, you're going to go, you know, you can guide them through and, and you can get through and you've made points that many things are common and don't feel embarrassed and, um, you know, maybe if you try one thing, there's another, there's another path to go on. And, and I think you've, you've done enlightening. So we're very grateful. And I hope, you know, if there are folks on this call that need assistance that, um, that they reach out to you. Um, so yeah. very, very grateful for your time. And also very grateful once again, for, for, uh, for you, uh, being recommended through Frank Pornizarian, who's on tonight's call. And, uh, and, and by the way, you know, when, when Kerry Lerman was, was presenting his drosh before, um, I, I quite honestly thought you were going to be talking about mandrakes to us. You know, I, I thought that was one, of, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in powder or, or pills or an injection, um, but um, that was quite, quite enlightening. But I think uh, we have a more modern uh, remedy to, put, to, uh, to write into the, uh, into the uh, next Jewish text of what, uh, what could be added to that, Carrie? Um, so, um, with that being said, you know, very much uh, thankful for um, for all the participation. And and by the way, I think there's a fellow urologist on this call here, uh, Danny Cosgrove. So, um, Danny, if you're there, you know, we definitely want to, uh, you know, if you'd like to chime in, you know, you're definitely a subject matter expert as well. And and maybe he dropped off. Maybe I mentioned it too late. Um, but just wanted to mention that. Um, so with that being said, uh, we can return some, uh, some minutes to your evening here. Um, once again, next, uh, next month, we will uh, have, a, have a discussion on everything uh, about COVID, uh, the, the, the vaccine, the, the virus that you were afraid to ask. So stay tuned for that. And uh, um, just if there's any uh, any good in welfare that anybody would like to come off of mute to mention to this group of uh, of any announcements, please uh, please feel free. Okay, 
Well, if it's all quiet there, I wish everybody a, a, a wonderful uh, rest of the week and a healthy week. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you everyone. I appreciate the time. Dr. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're quite welcome.